Hello everybody! <laughs> uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that new video that Rob uh, put together, some really nice footage there, hey? Um, yeah, just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Christy for those of you who uh, haven't met me yet, okay? <laughs> I'm going to be presenting um, the, the lecture tonight. Um, yeah, great to have you with us! <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, again, just wanted to remind you guys about the chat that we have on the side of your screen. Um, yeah, we love connecting with you guys. So if everyone could just drop your name in the comments there right now, just so we know who all is here. Uh, like I said, we do love uh, chatting with you and getting to know you guys. So do um, do that. So tonight we are going to be talking about um, one of my favorite groups, definitely one of the biggest groups. Um, and that is invertebrates. And so to channel my, you know, invertebrate vibes, I'm actually surrounded by some cushions. <laughs> so these are my jellyfish one. <laughs> okay. And then I've got a little octopus on this side. So, um, yeah, get yourselves nice and comfortable. Um, and yeah, let's, <laughs> let's get started. Um, so just a reminder before we do get started, um, I have been using our reef guide, so the Dennis King and Wilder Fraser reef guide. So um, yeah, definitely do have that on hand if you've got it. Um, again, with our invertebrates, I have put the page numbers up in the top right hand corner of the screen. So definitely you can be using that just to kind of refer to as we go. Um, and yeah, another thing, while we are on YouTube, um, feel free to subscribe to the channel, all right? We are going to be posting some um, videos. I know a lot of you have been really enjoying the identification, so definitely there will be videos there that you can go through and maybe practice some of your identification, um, just to kind of get you really up at that really good level, so that by the time you actually get in the water, you're an absolute pro. <laughs> okay, well, let's just uh, jump into it. So we are going to be talking about invertebrates tonight. Okay, definitely, like I said, one of the my favorite groups, one of the biggest groups. Um, so yeah, definitely very, very big groups. So I've actually condensed it quite a lot. Um, so we're not going to be going into a whole lot of detail with this, but I, I did want to try give you guys um, a really good overarching understanding of the different groups um, and yeah then it's up to you guys to kind of learn about the different species within those groups okay so yeah let's get started so what are invertebrates now invertebrates are animals that do not have a backbone so they don't have a spine um, you know a, a skeletal structure or anything like that okay they might have an exoskeleton or maybe a hard shell but they definitely don't have a spine you know like we do invertebrates are one of the biggest groups so you know they form 95 percent of all species on earth okay now that includes your terrestrial examples so think of things like your insects and that kind of thing all right uh, definitely you know there's a lot of insects in the world so definitely the invertebrates are quite a large group the invertebrates are an incredibly varied group as well they range from very simple body plans so think of things like your sponges to more complex you know complicated um, higher ranking species so think of things like your octopus um, they also form, you know, very bio, uh, very important biological and ecological roles. So think of things like your giant clams and your sea cucumbers. They filter the water, they filter, you know, the sand sediments, and so they have a really important role in keeping the reef nice and healthy. A lot of invertebrates are also commercially important. So again, thinking of things like your lobsters, shrimp, shellfish, and squid, you know, they form those really important um, uh, fishery industries, that kind of thing. So definitely very, very important group. Now invertebrates or inverts, as we like to kind of shorten it to, are, like I said, a huge group of animals with great diversity, covering many different types of body, size, shape, form, and function. They're not always super obvious on the reef because they hide away quite well, or they camouflage themselves quite well. So you actually need to train your eyes to actually spot some of those invertebrates. And it's always a good thing to actually know where to look when you are looking for them. <laughs> 
So we'll first kind of have a look at some feeding ecology. So some of the various different types of feeding methods. So because there are so many different, you know, bodies and forms and functions and that kind of thing in this group, there's a lot of different feeding methods or feeding strategies. So we're going to have a look at some of those first. So the first one we're going to look at here is our filter or suspension feeders. So these are things like your feather duster worms, all right, this example over here, um, giant clams and sponges. So your filter or suspension feeders will feed on floating organic matter in the water column. They rely on the movement of water to actually bring the food to the animal. They often have body parts that help them capture those food items from the water. Uh, so for example, our, you know, our tube worms over here, feather duster worms, okay? Or they might be pumping the water through the body to capture the food items internally. So thinking of things like your giant clams and your uh, sponges. Next we have our grazers. Grazers are kind of the lawn mowers of the reef, okay? So these are things like your sea urchins. They've got specialized mouth parts, which are being uh, demonstrated over here, that actually allow them to scrape algae off the substrate. So in this example, you can see there, the sea urchin, it's got five um, arrow-shaped teeth, all right? Um, and the special muscles kind of you know, control that whole movement. So we'll actually talk about the sea urchin teeth a little bit later, but I just want you to keep this video in mind when we do talk about it, okay? Next we have our deposit feeders. So these are things like your sea cucumbers. These guys feed on detritus, which is the remains of decomposing plants and animals on the seafloor. They sift through the sediments for these food particles. Sea cucumbers scoop clumps of sand into the mouth, they consume the edible bits, and then they will excrete uh, clean sand from the other end. We then have our scavengers, so things like your cleaner shrimp, our example over here, and um, a lot of our crab species are also scavengers. So these animals feed on the dead corpses of other animals, um, or they might feed on, you know, little parasites or that kind of thing, um, dead skin, dead, you know, tissue, that kind of thing from other animals as well. So they often, um, you know, perform a really important cleaning role in the reef or even just kind of, you know, cleaning up the reef itself. We also have carnivorous predators. So thinking of things like your crown of thorns starfish, your mantis shrimps, like our little example over here, and of course our Portuguese man of war. So carnivorous predators, of course, actively hunt and consume other living animals. So things like our crown of thorns, they will, they feed on live coral tissue. So they will crawl over, you know, a hard coral, they will digest the coral tissue outside of their body and then suck up that soupy digested mixture. Our mantis shrimps, like the little example over here, smash apart shellfish with oversized teardrop shaped forelimbs that can snap out with more acceleration than a .22 caliber bullet. One punch can deliver over 1,500 newtons of force. It's enough to shatter aquarium glass and even dismember the mantis shrimp's prey. It's so fast, in fact, that the clubs leave cavitation bubbles. These are pockets of air created by fast-moving liquids in their wake. Now, those bubbles, those cavitation bubbles, likely implode with enough force to stun prey, even if the mantis shrimp happens to miss. The clubs that the mantis shrimp use to bludgeon their prey to death are composed of three distinct layers optimized to minimize and distribute the amount of force that each blow delivers back to the shrimp's club, okay? And they're also, those three distinct layers, um, they also kind of make the club strong enough that it can, you know, break apart shellfish and, you know, shelled organisms and that kind of thing, but the, the clubs themselves do not shatter. So very, very strong, um, but also, I guess, flexible enough to deal with that force which is really cool. <laughs> okay, so we're heading into our identification now. 
So the first group we're going to look at is sponges. The sponges are found in all the world's oceans and they come in many shapes and sizes. They all are sessile benthic organisms, which means that um, they are, you know, they are attached to the substrates all the time. Okay, so that is their life. They, they spend their life attached to the substrate. They might have a larval phase, you know, floating around in the plankton, but they do spend their life attached to the substrate. They are found at nearly all depths and habitats as well due to their massive diversity. The basic body shape of a sponge is shaped by its nature as a filter feeder. Sponges pump water through channels and canals within their bodies, filtering out organic material as they do so. The pumping of water is driven by many small flagella, which are these tiny little cells that kind of look like little hair. Um, and they've got like a little tail that beats. So these little flagella are within the animal um, and that is what causes that water current. Okay, so they don't have a specialized pumping organ. Um, they actually don't have any specialized organs. Um, a, a sponge is technically just a collection of specialized cells. So we can see this example over here uh, performing that pumping action. So sponges possess a large X current opening called an ossicule. So this one over here would be the ossicule, this big opening here. And then they've got all these tiny pores on the sides called ostia. So, um, you know, it's too small to see in, in this example here, but over the entire body, um, or I guess entire organism here, there will be these tiny little pores. Water is drawn in through the ostia by the beating of cilia. So again, uh, other types of little cells, um, that um, yeah, can also help create that uh, water current. And this water is drawn in for feeding and respiration. They are very efficient filter feeders using a matrix of canals to filter food out of the water with their main source of nutrition being bacteria. This process of feeding is carried out at an astounding rate. A typical sponge pumps four to five times its own volume every minute. For a medium-sized individual, this equates to thousands of litres a day. As a result, they have earned the reputation as vacuums of the sea. Now, they also um, uh, are found in um, symbiotic relationships with other organisms. Okay, So they often have symbiotic um, cyanobacteria that live within their tissues. And then you also get lots of other filter feeding organisms like feather stars, um, and little sea cucumbers and that kind of thing that are found in close proximity to sponges because of their ability to create those currents um, and so bring in more plankton. Now identifying sponges to species level is extremely difficult and it often requires dissection of samples under high powered microscopes. For that reason, sponge identification is mostly done on shape and functional group. The walls of sponges are structured with tiny crystal spicules of silica or calcium carbonate, and it is these spicules that are used for identification down to species level. So I've got this little video here, which um, I'm just going to start again there. So this is um, an example of the, the pumping ability of sponges. So this diver is squirting some non-toxic dye at the base of these tube sponges. And you can see within seconds that the, the water coming through the sponge. So the pumping action is very, very quick. Um, and like I said, this means that sponges have a very important role on our reefs to keep the water nice and clean, nice and healthy. Um, I'll just play it again in case uh, you, you wanted to see that again. So, you know, they keep our, our reefs nice and clean. They keep the um, nutrient levels in the water uh, low so that there's lots of light for the corals um, to survive. So this is an excerpt of a, a bit of a longer video, and I have linked to the whole video um, on our related materials section on the online classroom. So do go have a look at that video. It's quite interesting. Next, we have our jellyfish. Uh, so jellyfish, their body is actually made up of 98% water. Uh, they've got a ring of muscles around the dome. So kind of in this area here, uh, just on the underside of that dome, that's where the mouth is. So that's where the muscles are. 
And those muscles are what, you know, they contract and relax. And that is how the jellyfish is able to actively move through the water um, from that, you know, pulsing motion of that dome. Of course, jellyfish are in the same family as corals and anemones. And so they do have stinging cells or nematocysts uh, covering their tentacles, which they use to um, capture their prey. They can occur seasonally in large numbers. So, um, you know, they, they really like the calm, nutrient-rich waters because that's got a high abundance of prey. Next, we have our anemones. Again, nice and closely related with our corals. So, the basic body plan of the anemone is quite simple, consisting of a hollow tube with muscular walls. The crown of tentacles is the most obvious feature which surrounds the mouth and functions in obtaining food. The tentacles are covered in stinging cells which are used to capture prey and um, uh, uh, repel predators. So in these examples you can pretty much only see the, the, um, you know, the, the tentacles in these examples here. Again the tentacles of this tube anemone is quite um, obvious here and again in this example as well. So here are some examples of the different anemones you can find in Sedwana. Um, you'll see some of them, you know, most of them do have some kind of symbiotic relationship, all right, um, but I guess it's not, they don't need those little shrimp and anemone fish and that kind of thing to live in their tentacles, all right, they can do okay on their own, um, but yeah, often, often, you know, you do get other little organisms that make use of you know, the, the protection that the anemone provides. Um, so we can see there's lots of different variety in the, the types of anemones that you can find. So definitely they are fun to look for. Next we have our hydrozoans, also called hydroids. So these are small predatory animals. Uh, they are related to jellyfish and corals. They are in the Cnidarian phylum. Okay, so remember, everything in the Cnidarian phylum has those stinging cells. Now, the cool thing about hydroids or hydrozoans is that you get some of these organisms that are solitary and some that are colonial. So some that are solitary might be, you know, these examples over here, they... They live in close proximity to each other, but they're not actually connected at all. Um, and then you have the colonial organisms. So, for example, our Portuguese man of war. All right, we also like to call them blue bottles here in South Africa, um, but I guess their more uh, universal name would be a Portuguese man of war. They are actually a colony of hydroid organisms. Okay, so you've got one hydroid that is going to be forming the sail. One will be forming the digestive tissues. One will be forming the, um, the reproductive tissues. Um, and then one will be forming the, um, you know, hunting tentacles or feeding tentacles, whatever you want to call it. Uh, stinging tentacles, that's the one I'm looking for. Okay, so the, the hydroids that form the Portuguese man of war can only exist in that colony, all right? So they, they are not able to survive on their own. They do need to form that colony to be able to survive, which is really very, very interesting. Next, we have our comb jellies. Now, comb jellies are also, you know, uh, jelly-like animals. They often are mistaken for jellyfish, but they are not real... Um, you know, they are not jellyfish because they do not have stinging cells. Instead, they've got uh, what we call sticky cells. Okay, so they've got these kind of glue-like structures on the tentacles that they can put out. Um, and that is what they use to actually capture their prey. Now, you'll see here, um, they've got these rows of, um, you know, these flashing lights. Okay, so they don't actually produce their own light. The, the light that you see on these guys is actually just light reflecting off these tiny little hairs that beat, okay? And it's the beating of those hairs or cilia that actually help these guys move around. So I've got a little video that kind of demonstrates this a little bit better. So you can see the, the rows of cilia or tiny hair-like structures that beat 
as the cilia beads, light is reflected off them at different times, and this is what gives the comb jellies their dazzling, you know, disco display. <laughs> So remember, they do have that sticky substance on their tentacles. So that's what this image here is showing. Uh, the tentacles, you know, they come out, they catch their prey, which is, you know, little shrimps and other um, planktonic organisms. And then they stick onto those things and bring it up towards the mouth. So you can find comb jellies in the upper layers of the water because this is where the plankton they feed on is most likely to be found. Our sea squirts are also known as ascidians or tunicates. These strange creatures look simple, but they actually have a very complex body plan and development. They form the link between invertebrates and vertebrates, to which we humans belong. These creatures are found either solitary or in colonies. The solitary species are spherical or conical in shape, and they are attached to the substrates at one end. The other end, can, um, has two openings okay so we can see each one of these they've got two two openings the incurrent and the excurrent siphons the colonial species form encrusting mats with the siphons giving the surface a quite a perforated appearance Our flatworms, all right, so a lot of people see these and get them confused between nudibranchs, okay, I just want to point out that they are two separate groups, okay, so flatworms are in the platyhelminth group, where the, um, the nudibranchs are actually a mollusk, so more like a sea slug, you know, a snail type of animal, okay, so um, yeah, just keep that in mind as I point out some of the differences while I kind of chat through this, okay? <laughs> so our flatworms, you know, they're quite easily identified by having a flat leaf-like or ribbon-like body. And very importantly, they don't have any external appendages. So they're quite smooth on their bodies. You can see there's no, you know, there's no fluffy gills. There's no funny tentacles or anything poking off there. They're quite um, flat in appearance. Now they are very brightly colored often and so that's often why they get confused with nudibranchs. So they actually mimic nudibranchs because nudibranchs are known to their predators as being foul tasting or poisonous. So those flatworms actually, you know, take on that nudibranch coloration so that, you know, they, they are protected from those predators themselves. They are able to swim and they look quite beautiful when they are swimming. I don't know if any of you have managed to see them free swimming like this, but they kind of undulate their bodies and they look a bit like a gymnastics um, ribbon. You know, when they're doing that ribbon show in the Olympics, I always love watching that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, these guys remind me a lot of those ribbons that, you know, get waved about. <laughs> So having a look at our examples of flatworms here, again, we can see they are quite you know, uh, quite flat in appearance. You know, they might have this undulated side of their bodies. They might have, you know, um, these, I guess, tiny little tentacles, but not really, you know, there's no really extensive protrusions or anything on their bodies. So definitely you, you can identify these guys as flatworms. Then we have our tube worms. So tube worms, um, their bodies are made up of identical segments with unique head and tail segments. So the head and the tail will be a little bit different to the rest of the segments that make up the whole organism. These guys often live in coral heads or burrow into rocks, sand or muddy areas. They are filter feeders, so they do require areas of rich suspension. And that is because they extend these really beautiful feathery gills or feeding structures into the water to capture that planktonic prey. Um, and they also use the, the feathery tentacles and all of that for breathing as well. So it's got like a two part function. So having a look at our examples here, up at the top here, we have our Christmas tree worms. Okay, these are quite common. Um, they're quite fun to, to look at. They, they often suck into their hole if they feel threatened, um, and then it takes a little bit of time for them to come out again. So definitely they are fun to look at. So we've got our Christmas tree worms up at the top here, and then our feather duster worms at the bottom. 
So our Christmas tree worms build a calcareous tube inside of coral to protect their soft bodies. So to do this, they actually nestle their bodies against the living tissue of the coral, which forces the coral polyps to grow around the worm's body. Christmas tree worms are filter feeders. Their food consists of zooplankton, phytoplankton, and detritus particles. They extend their feeding gills or radioles. Okay, so these, you know, uh, feathery structures, they extend those into the water column from a little opening in the tube and prey is trapped and moved by tiny little hairs lining the feeding apparatus towards the opening of the tube and into the mouth. So just a quick note with your Christmas tree worms, two trees is one worm. Okay, so, so this one over here, you can actually see a tiny little bit of the head, you know, in this area here. Um, but each worm actually projects out two little Christmas trees, if that makes sense. Um, so you've got one worm here, one worm here, one here, one here, one here, etc. Okay, compare that with your feather duster worms, you know, one of these is one worm. So your feather duster worms, their tubes are made out of a tough parchment-like material that the worm excretes itself, and it may be strengthened by little bits of sand or shells, that kind of thing. Now the feathery arms or tentacles are also called radioles, so all of these things here are called radioles, and they are also used for both a feeding and breathing function. Next we have a group that I've kind of grouped all of these together, uh, your shrimps, crabs and lobsters. So they are part of the arthropoda um, group, which is the largest group of animals on the planet. They are an incredibly varied group, okay, with a huge amount of adaptations and that kind of thing. Um, so if I, if I was going to break this down into each group, you know, we'd be sitting here forever. <laughs> okay, so I've just kind of grouped it all here together for you now. But I have linked to some other um, related materials, videos, um, articles, that kind of thing for you guys to read as well. Um, so... Within this group, they do have an exoskeleton, okay, so that is actually what links them all together. They've got that hard exoskeleton, you know, it's a bit like a shell, um, and that's what actually provides protection for the soft, um, soft body on the inside. Now, when they get too big for their exoskeleton, they shed the exoskeleton or they molt it, um, and then they are vulnerable for, you know, a couple of hours while they... Um, strengthen and build their new exoskeleton that will be a little bit bigger. Uh, your shrimps, crabs and lobsters are often quite, um, I guess, cryptic. So they are often hiding away, quite well camouflaged and that kind of thing. So you really do need to train your eyes to find them. Now you'll notice here that I have a hermit crab um, included in this group. So technically the hermit crab isn't actually a true crab, all right? It's kind of in its own little group, um, but they are really cool, which is why I included it here. Okay, um, again, I, I have linked to some more information about them as well. Moving on to our carry snails. So these are little snails that um, are fairly shy. They have a very glossy, smooth, egg-shaped shell. Um, now, most snails, okay, um, think of your garden snails, you know, all your other snails that you get in the ocean as well, they've got what we call an operculum. Now, the operculum is basically like a little trap door, and it sits on, you know, the, the, the foot of the, the snail. And so when there's danger, the snail will pull himself into, you know, pull all his tissue, all his, um, you know, soft yummy bits into the shell and he shuts the shell closed with that trapdoor, with that operculum. Now carry snails do not have an operculum. Instead they've got a really thin uh, hole or aperture, okay, and that aperture actually has a tooth-like structure. So that tooth-like, those tooth-like grooves make it difficult for predators to reach, um, reach them when they do go inside their shells. But often you actually do find them on the reef like in these pictures. So you can see the, this is the shell over here and then this is the snail, 
Okay, so the snail, the mantle, the mantle is the tissue. So we can see the tissue is often, you know, um, almost covering the entire shell. In this case, it is. You can't see the shell in this example, all right? In these ones here, this white bit is the shell and the rest of this is the mantle. Now the mantle is what actually secretes the protein and calcium carbonate to build, repair and enlarge the shell. So like we were talking about earlier, you know, the um, thinking of things like our hermit crabs. Okay, so hermit crabs, they when they grow too big um, for the shell that they are currently using, they leave that shell and they go and find a new shell that's a little bit bigger that they are able to fit into. Now, cowrie shells don't do that. They can't leave their shell. So instead, they actually dissolve a little bit of their shell and make it bigger. Okay, so they, the, as the need for a bigger shell arises, the snail dissolves part of the shell and rebuilds it a little bit bigger to allow for that constant growth, which is pretty cool. Then we have our giant clams. So giant clams are part of the group called bivalves, okay? And this means that it's made up of two shell segments that can be brought together. Um, and this is for protection from predators or exposure. Now, what we mean by exposure is often you have clams and that kind of thing that like to be found in tidal areas. Think of things like your tide pools, that kind of thing. It's where the, you know, the, the tide goes in and out. And so there might be... Uh, you know, times of the day where they are not covered by water at all, so they're out in the open. And so what they do in those situations is they will close their shell up really, really tight, and that actually keeps them, you know, hydrated and all of that inside the shell, so they don't dry out by the sun. So giant clams have a very colourful, fleshy mantle, which can be seen when the shell is open, like in these instances here, you can see all of that beautiful um, lovely colorful tissue there. Now the mantle in giant clams, they've actually got the same symbiotic algae that, that zooxanthellae, that corals have. So the, you know, the giant clams can also um, receive quite a lot of energy from that photosynthetic algae. Now giant clams are endangered in many parts of the world due to intensive exploitation by um, fishing vessels. Mainly the large adults are killed because they are the most profitable. They are sold for their meat because they are a delicacy in some countries. Um, and some people also use the adductor muscles. Now the adductor muscle is the, the muscle that actually joins the two shells together. Um, and so that's what actually controls, you know, the opening and closing of the shell. Now some people use that muscle um, as, you know, uh, traditional medicines and that kind of thing. And of course, the shells themselves are very beautiful as well, and so they are often sold as decorative ornaments. Now, giant clams really do live up to their name as being giants, all right? They can weigh up to 200 kilos and can live for over 100 years. Now, there's a bit of a misconception that giant clams can, you know, close up and trap a human inside the shell. You know, if you've got your hand or something nearby, it'll snap shut and trap you there. Okay, that's a bit of a, um, a bit of a misconception. Okay, so those adductor muscles that open and close the shell, they actually work quite slowly. Okay, so it, you'll never be in a situation where um, you'll be surprised by the shell snapping shut, okay, that's not going to happen, um, at least with this species. Um, yeah, in, in situations where, where divers maybe have become trapped, it's more likely that they've put their finger there or, you know, whatever body part they've put there, and they've just waited to see what happens. Okay, so you're not going to be surprised by it, you're definitely going to be doing that on purpose. Um, please don't do that, we do not encourage, you know, that kind of um, interaction with our marine environment. Moving on to definitely one of my favorite groups, okay, this is the nudibra uh, nudibranchs. So these are um, basically like little sea slugs. So the colors are incredibly diverse and often very beautiful. Um, they've got, they do have some external appendages, which I'm going to just point out here for you. So looking at these examples here, we've got some tentacles on the head, which are called rhinophores. And then we've got some of these kind of fluffy looking structures at the back. And these are actually the gills. So these gills are also known as serrata. 
So nudie brank literally translates to naked gills. Okay, so those, those gill structures over here, these exposed gills, that's where they get their name from. Now, almost all nudibranchs are carnivores and they feed on a variety of things, including sponges, hydroids, tunicates, anemones, or even other nudibranchs. One species, this one in particular, this is Glaucus atlanticus, feeds on the Portuguese man of war. And instead of di digesting the stinging cells that the Portuguese man of war has, it deposits them along the surface of its skin to use as a defense against other predators. Other species that feed on anemones or sponges may use, um, you know, th those defense mechanisms in a similar way. We also get a group of anemones called sap-sucking slugs. These are a distant relative of the nudibranchs and they feed on the internal cell structures of plants. Now, some of these harvest the, the chloroplasts from the plants. So if we think back to, you know, high school or, you know, biology in primary school, that kind of thing, your chloroplasts are the cells, um, or sorry, the cell organelles within plant cells that um, actually do the photosynthesis. So that is where photosynthesis happens in plants. So these sap-sucking slugs, they harvest those chloroplasts in a live state, okay? And so that means that the chloroplasts actually continue to perform photosynthesis. And so they feed these sap-sucking slugs their major share of energy. And so we often like to call these solar-powered slugs, which is cool. Now, another one of the really special nudibranchs is actually this individual here, and it's definitely my favorite um, of the nudibranchs. This is the Bornella anguilla, um, also known as the snaky Bornella. Now, this one is special because it's one of the only nudibranchs that can actually swim quite well. Now, you'll probably recognize this from our opening um, video or that intro video that we played earlier. Um, you you might have seen that little snaky Bornella really undulating its body midwater to swim um, to swim wherever it was going to. <laughs> so they're they're definitely one of my favorites. Always fun to watch when they are free swimming like that. Now, most nudibranchs are hermaphrodites, which means that simultaneous fertilization is possible. You may see their spawn ribbons on hard substrates of the reef. The eggs, like in this example here, um, are usually coated in a toxic substance that pr um, protects them from any potential predators. Now, having a look at this row at the bottom, we've got some nudibranchs mating. So they sometimes, you know, come side by side like this, Otherwise, they might form, you know, like a follow the leader kind of position. Um, and then this example here, you can actually see this nudibranch laying um, that ribbon of eggs. Having a look at some of the different types of nudibranchs we get, um, you can see again, incredibly varied in color, in shape, um, you know, in the different um, appendages that they might have, okay? Now you're probably saying, well, this one over here doesn't have any, you know, external gills that we can see. Um, and that's true. So um, there are some groups of nudibranchs uh, that are actually, they've kind of moved their gills around. Um, so they actually kind of hide them underneath the, the, um, the tissue. So they kind of hide them underneath the sides of the of the body here. Um, so it's kind of like they've got a skirt on and they're they're hiding all their all their bits under the skirt. But again, we can definitely spot those uh, really definite, you know, um, tentacles or rhinophores. Okay, so definitely when you are looking um, at something and you want to work out whether it's a flatworm or a nudibranch, first thing you want to do is look out for those tentacles. Next, we have the octopus. So octopus are benthic animals and are usually quite hard to find as they live in caves and under rocks and mostly only come out at nighttime. An octopus has no internal bone structure and as a result, it can fit its entire body um, through very small gaps as long as its beak can fit through there. So that's what this um, little video is showing here. So you can see that octopus really squeezing itself through this tiny little opening. Now their eyes are considered to be 
um, you know, the most sophisticated of all invertebrates, although they evolved entirely separately to mammalian eyes. Now, this is a case of convergent evolution, where the same feature has evolved completely independently in different organisms. The eyes of the larger squid are the largest known eyes in the animal kingdom. Now, octopus have an amazing ability to change color and texture of the skin. And I'm sure you guys have probably had the chance to see that maybe for yourselves, um, if you're lucky, you know, in the water. Um, otherwise, definitely on videos and that kind of thing. I'm sure you've seen, you know, octopus changing color, changing texture, really blending in with its environment. And they do that by these amazing little organelles that they have called chromatophores. And so that's what this little um, video here is demonstrating. So these chromatophores are little organs that are present in the skin of many cephalopods. Okay, cephalopods are things like your squid, octopus, and cuttlefish. And these chromatophores contain pigment sacs that become more visible as small little muscles pull the sac open, making the pigment expand under the skin. Chromatophore pigments are typically only red, yellow, or brown. Other colors are attainable by using a second layer of structure in the cephalopod skin called iridophores. The iridophores are stacks of very thin, uh, very thin cells that are capable of reflecting light back at different wavelengths and possibly even different polarities. Interestingly, the color an iridophore reflects is dependent on the angle from which they are observed. Octopus change the texture of the skin through papillae, which are little projections of the skin which can be deformed and reformed using hydrostatic mechanisms. Octopus crawl over the benthos using their legs for movement. However, when they wish to move fast, usually to avoid predators, they use jet propulsion by compressing water out of their mantle. Swimming in this way means the octopus appears to be swimming backwards with its mantle first and legs trailing. This is quite an inefficient method of propulsion and so it's only used if it's really needed. Now octopus are nearly exclusively solitary um, animals and they only come together when they are ready to breed and mate. Sea stars, feather stars, urchins, and sea cucumbers are all part of the phylum called Echinodermata. And Echinodermata translates to spiny skin. So all of these organisms have calcareous skeletons composed of plates or ossicles made from calcite, which can either um, you know, be fused to form, for example, the, the shell of the sea urchin, um, or maybe it articulates to form the, the arms of the sea stars. These calcite ossicles tend to, um, or you know, they can extend as external projections. So for example, they can form spines or little warts along the surface of the animal. Um, and then sea stars also have a water vascular system, which helps with locomotion by pushing fluid into the tube feet, which are these little orange uh, suction cup looking um, structures on this example here. The mouth is against the substrate um, and the anus is on top. Okay, so there, there's quite an obvious, there's usually quite an obvious, you know, opening or pore somewhere in this, you know, middle area, okay? There's also a smaller opening along, on the top um, that's a little bit just off center, okay? And now that is called the madreporite. So the madreporite acts a bit like a water filter for that water vascular system. Um, it prevents any sediments or any other contaminants from entering the water vascular system. Um, system of the starfish. Now the sea star actually feeds by extending its stomach out of its mouth. So you can see that in this example here, this squishy kind of looking thing, that is the stomach coming out of the mouth. It, you know, it protrudes its stomach um, out of its mouth and over the digestible parts of the prey, such as mussels and clams, the prey tissue is partially digested externally before it's all sucked inside to finish digestion um, in the digestive glands that run down each arm. 
Now beyond their distinctive shape, sea stars are famous for their ability to regenerate limbs and in some cases entire bodies, um, which is the case in this organism here. So this will be, you know, a, a single arm of the adult that, you know, detached for whatever reason and now it is currently growing a whole new little animal off that one arm, which is pretty cool. They accomplish this by housing most or all of their vital organs in their arms. Some require the central body to be intact to regenerate, um, but some species can grow an entirely new star just from a small portion of that severed limb. Sea stars do have a light sensing eye on the tip of each arm. The modified tube feet uh, near this eye are used for chemo sensing. So you can see that, that example here. So we've got two little, you know, kind of longer tube feet with the little orange uh, sucker like um, structure at the end. Okay, those are those modified tube feet which they use to smell the water. You've also got some, um, some species that have these uh, papillae, okay, on the surface. So particularly your cushion star, they've got these papillae along the surface of the, the sea star that kind of make it look a bit fuzzy, all right? Now, now, it looks fuzzy because of that papillae, which are these little transparent projections, um, but it's actually, you know, the breathing organ of the, the sea star. So that is how the sea star facilitates gas exchange. So looking at some of our examples here, probably our, you know, one that we, um, is maybe a little bit misunderstood, I guess, or has a bad reputation, let's put it that way. It's got a bad reputation. This is our crown of thorns sea star. Now, the crown of thorns sea star has quite an important and active role in maintaining coral reef biodiversity because it actually drives ecological succession. When the populations of the crown of thorns are under control, they prevent fast growing corals from overgrowing the slower growing corals. Okay, but in large numbers, this sea star can cause quite dramatic um, coral decline. So definitely when things are, you know, not in balance, they can cause issues. Um, but in their natural, um, you know, their natural numbers, they are quite important on our reefs. Next, we have our feather stars. Okay, so feather stars have these really long, lovely feathery arms that they often hold up into the water column to aid filter feeding. While doing this, they are attached to the reef at their center, which you can probably see best in this example over here. So you can see this little feather star, he's hanging on to this bit of coral um, with these little structures at the bottom in the middle. So, you know, the, the video that's playing at the moment, you probably did see the, the feather stars swimming. So they, they do have that ability that they can swim using their arms. Um, for the most part, they usually uh, crawl around as far as I know. So again, you know, attached to the, the reef like so, and they crawl around using this. They can use their arms to crawl around as well, but for the most part, um, yeah, they, they don't swim too often. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, now they do have these, uh, they, are, they often do have these little symbiotic relationships with other organisms as well. So you can see there's little fish, uh, little shrimps, that kind of thing that have adapted to live on um, these feather stars, which is quite cool. You'll see in this example over here, the, the arms are kind of curled in. Okay, so they, this is often what they look like during the day. Um, they, they mostly come out at night time to, you know, extend themselves and feed. Um, but sometimes you are lucky. Sometimes you are lucky during the day and you might see them open like this as well. Now, they are quite common in Sidwana. You get feather stars um, pretty much on every reef, I believe. They, they are very, very common um, there. But sometimes people don't always know what they're looking at. So often, you know, they might be in you know, in little crevices and that kind of thing. And you might just see one of the arms sticking out and it's kind of like, well, what is that? Okay, now you know what to look for. Okay, so you know what the, the arms look like. So you know what to look for next time you do have the chance to get in the water. Next, we have our sea urchins. 
So again, these are, you know, fairly small animals. Um, they've got a round body and lots of movable spines. So, you know, you've got all these really sharp spines that stick up um, and their spines actually can move. So I included a picture of the skeletons here. Uh, you often find these on the beach. Um, if you ever walk along the beach um, at the tide line, you might find some of these washed up. Okay, um, yeah, if you didn't know what they were, now you do. They are the, the um, spine, oh, sorry, the um, uh, shell, the, the test. Uh, that's the actual word, the test of the, the sea urchin, which is cool. So, like we said earlier, the mouth is made up of these five strong calcium carbonate arrow-shaped teeth. Okay, so you remember that video that I showed towards the beginning? So they've got all these teeth that are pointing towards the middle of the mouth, and then they've got a fleshy, tongue-like structure on the inside. Now, this entire chewing organism is known as Aristotle's lantern. So they have specialized muscles that control um, how the jaw protrudes, um, it controls the action of the teeth, and that kind of thing. And so that's what allows the animal to grasp, scrape, pull and tear at algae. Now sea urchins can move, although they do move very slowly. They crawl along with tube feet and sometimes they can even push themselves along using their spines. Lastly, we have our sea cucumbers. So the sea cucumbers are cylindrical, um, elongated organisms. They've got an internal skeleton composed of plates of calcium carbonate um, that are embedded in the skin. They breathe through their anus. So sea cucumbers um, extract oxygen from water in a pair of respiratory trees that branch off of the cloaca just inside the anus. So they breathe by drawing water in through the anus and then expelling it. They're very important um, on our reef. They actually um, help recycle nutrients and break down detritus because they actually, um, I guess, filter feed um, on, the, on the sand. So they filter out the sand um, and they keep the sand nice and clean of bacteria and that kind of thing. They've also got very, um, very good um, defense mechanisms. Okay, so this example over here is showing those defense mechanisms, or at least one of them. Okay, so they've got what we call cuvarian tubules. So basically, when the sea cucumber gets stressed, it'll um, eviscerate, which means it um, expels all of these sticky tubules, these sticky cuvarian tubules um, from the uh, from the anus because they are these tubules are kind of extensions of those breathing trees or respiratory trees um, and when they do eviscerate they often also discharge a toxic chemical and so this can often kill any animals in the vicinity um, and that's this is yeah how these guys protect themselves this one over here is called a sea apple that's what we call them here in Sudwana um, they are a type of sea um, sea cucumber and they're quite fun to see. You don't see them too often. They actually usually bury themselves. Um, you don't often see the whole body out like in this example. Um, so definitely do look out for them. Okay, so we're going to just kind of test our knowledge now. So just kind of testing ourselves on the different uh, groups that we've looked at here. So first up, you know, uh, we can see those large X currents openings. Okay, so definitely this is a sponge. Next up, we've got this one, you know, uh, very colorful, okay, um, but quite flat, all right? We can't see any, um, you know, gill, you know, those feathery gills or anything. So definitely this is a um, flatworm. All right, then we've got this, you know, cylindrical bodied um, animal. You'll have the mouth on one end and the anus on the other end. Okay, so of course, this is a sea cucumber. All right, this one, okay, so we know that this is, you know, those feathery um, trees that kind of stick out, okay? Um, if we remember, you know, the two of these makes up one little organism. So this is, of course, a Christmas tree worm. So um, in terms of your groupings, this would be a tube worm. All right, this one, okay, this is, of course, um, you know, we can see it's got a bit of a, 
a bit of an exoskeleton there. It's got those um, jointed foot. Okay, so we've got all these jointed appendages here. Um, of course, this is an example of our harlequin shrimp. Um, so yes, we this will be classed as our um, shrimp, crab, and lobster grouping. All right, another one. So we've got this dome-like structure and the you know long stinging tentacles. All right, so of course this is a jellyfish. Okay, this looks like a jelly kind of animal, all right, but we can see those flashy lights <laughs> down the side. Remember though, this animal does not produce its own light, it's just reflecting light off all these little cilia that beat to move it around the place. Um, remember they've got sticky tentacles, okay, so not stinging tentacles, so not jellyfish. They are of course comb jellies. All right, this one, okay, so we can see two openings all right, so of course this is an ascidian, tunicate, or sea squirt, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think for this for this course we've we've gone with sea squirt. That tends to be the easiest one. Okay, we've got these really you know leathery looking tentacles poking up here. Um, Ten points if you spot the fish. <laughs> okay, so this one of course is an anemone. Okay, here we've got our master of camouflage, the master of disguise. All right, so remember all those different ways um, that they can, you know, blend into their surroundings using those chromatophores, iridophores, and um, those papillae to change their texture. So, of course, this is an octopus. All right, so we've got something here that's got, you know, these feathery tentacles, um, poking out of a what looks like a tube okay um, so definitely because we can see that tube we can very safely say that this is of course a tube worm all right um, now I do recognize that these can be easily um, misidentified with your um, the the feather stars okay so again you just want to really um, try and identify that tube that sits over here um, and that will help you um, very confidently say that it is, of course, a tube worm. All right, here we've got a little animal here living in a, an anemone, okay? Um, so, of course, we've got these jointed appendages again. So, of course, this is, you know, a little crab, okay? Um, so, it is in our, you know, that grouping with crabs, shrimps, and lobsters. All right, we've got an animal here that is quite, you know, um, star-shaped, okay, so that's, you know, a pretty good indication of what it is already. Uh, so, of course, that is a sea star. Okay, we've got another little animal here. We can see him hiding in the coral, which is quite fun. Um, we can see he's got little pinches here and jointed appendages down at the bottom there. This is, of course, a little coral crab. Now, the cool thing about coral crabs, which I didn't mention earlier, is they actually have a bit of a symbiotic relationship with the coral that they live in. So they actually protect the coral that they live in. So you'll remember the crown of thorns sea star likes to eat hard corals, particularly those fast growing corals like Acropora and Posilopora. Okay, guess where this little crab is living? Exactly. So he lives in those Acropora and Posilopora coral colonies. So whenever a sea star or anything comes, um, you know, crawls onto this guy's home to try and start eating that coral, he'll actually use his little pinches to actually nip at the tube feeds of that sea star and kind of chase it away. So, you know, he, he's looking out for his little home, which is great. Moving on, we've got, you know, a small round animal here with lots of long, you know, sharp pointy spines. Of course, this is a sea urchin. Okay, over here, we've got what looks like a little snail, um, you know, with an egg-shaped shell. Okay, we can see the mantle is covering pretty much, you know, the whole shell, which is um, quite common with these animals. Um, and then something I didn't mention earlier is that these guys are often found on these, you know, soft coral um, and sponges because they love eating it. So again, you can see here already, this guy has already started munching at this um, colony of soft coral here. Um, but yes, of course, this is a carry snail. 
Okay, here, you know, we've got something. It's, you know, the first thing I can see when I look at this is, of course, these feathery gills um, sitting over here. And if we have a look at the other end, we can see some really small little rhinophores poking out here. So, of course, this is a nudibranch. All right, here, another one that's actually quite easy to identify. All right, we can see that hard exoskeleton, those jointed appendages. All right, of course, this is in our um, shrimp, crab, and lobster uh, you know, grouping. Um, and this one is, of course, a little lobster. Okay, here we've got something with, you know, those feathery uh, tentacles or arms, whatever you want to call them again, and we can see they're quite um, curled in. So having a look over here, I actually can see that, um, you know, little gripping structure that um, these guys have. So this one is a feather star, okay? This is not um, a tube worm, so it's not a feather duster worm, it is a feather star. All right, then we've got this very colorful looking animal. You know, we've got these um, very bright, uh, fleshy structures over here. Okay, um, it is enclosed by two shells. So of course, this is a giant clam. Okay, so that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, just wanted to let you guys know the quizzes will be available till midday on Sunday. Okay, so if you haven't done the quizzes yet, don't stress, you've still got a little bit of time um, before you get to that moment where you can actually earn that certificate of completion. Okay, um, so you've still got a bit of time, but do, do not forget. Okay, so you've got until Sunday. Um, again, uh, just wanted to remind you about the um, the you know, practicing your ID and that kind of thing um, by looking at the videos that we have on the YouTube channel and that kind of thing. Um, if you wanted to try your hand at identifying your dive buddies, you could maybe participate in the uh, competition that we're running at the moment. Um, and you can head to the Coral Divers Facebook page to read up about that competition. Um, but yeah, definitely, if you if you feel like you can't identify fish and um, you know invertebrates and that kind of thing yet, maybe you know you can challenge yourself to identify some dive buddies um, and maybe win some prizes in the meantime. Okay, so um, I am going to stick around now for some questions if we have any. Okay, so again, just feel free to um, yeah write them in the chat. I'll hang around for a little bit and try to answer any of your questions. Um, otherwise, again, remember we've got that discussion group. Um, again, you know, we've had a lot of interaction with that already. So thank you for that. Keep on posting. Um, I have posted a few videos there myself, a um, few little different things. Also in the classroom, we've been posting things there. So definitely do, um, you know, use all of those uh, resources available to you. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys, I hope you all enjoyed that tonight. Uh, definitely it's one of the longer ones. Um, I'm sorry we did go a little bit over time. Um, but yeah, it's always one that's a bit fun to talk about. So uh, yeah, it's always, always great. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm not seeing any questions right now. So I think you probably have other things to do. That's okay. All right. Uh, don't forget, we do have that Facebook discussion group. You can always post your questions there. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions you have there. Uh, yeah, otherwise, again, reminder, tomorrow is our last lecture, which is really sad. <laughs> I know I'm sad about the course ending, um, but yeah, so it's definitely going to be a good one. So do, uh, do stop in, do join us. Um, and yeah, we look forward to chatting with you again tomorrow. Have a great night, everybody. Bye. <laughs>